break. Hurry, Mr. Bergeron's on. Don't forget the popcorn, Frank. Coming, dear. Um, the file of life, which some of you may have, which has a lot of other instructions in it, often has a, 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 a so-called DNR section on it that says, I don't want to be resuscitated in the event that something happens. That doesn't count. That doesn't count. You need to use the, the Department of Public Health DNR form in order for the EMT to believe it. Once again, in order to appreciate this, put yourself in the, the position of the EMT, right? He walked through the door, you're on the floor, and he's got to make a kind of a liability decision, right? Do I want to, I know that my training says what I'm supposed to do is do everything I can to resuscitate that person who, who is on the floor, right? And I cannot get in trouble by doing that, right? I can get in trouble by not doing that, right? And so, and so you're trying to help that EMT deal with that issue at that particular moment. And that's why you want to have this, you know, on the refrigerator, you want to make things really clear. Because otherwise you can understand the, 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 the EMT, you can understand it from the EMT's perspective. Um, finally, dealing with this issue, the five wishes. Does anyone, has anyone done a five wishes form? No. Has anyone seen or heard of the five wishes? I'm just going to mention this because it may come up. Uh, there is a form uh, which I see relatively often called the Five Wishes, which was originally generated by a company in Florida, I believe. And the goal of the form was to allow you in a document to deal with some of these issues regarding, uh, we'll call it end of life care, or regarding care when you're incapable of making the decision. Now, one of the five wishes that is in the Five Wishes form actually is a healthcare proxy. Uh, it, is your, it is your wish regarding who the person is that you want to name as your healthcare proxy. The form typically has the witness lines at the end so that there are two witness lines saying that they've seen you sign and all that jazz. So the form constitutes a valid healthcare proxy in Massachusetts. The problem though is it also, the Five Wishes also has some other sections and it has one section that explains, for example, how it is that you want, what kind of care you want, how you want to be treated in the event that certain things happen, you know, that in the event that, you know, you, you, you know you, if you require feeding, what kind of feeding that should be, et cetera, et cetera. So there's all this other stuff in this form. So now, once again, put yourself in the position of the doctor, right? So now you're in the hospital, and you're in some condition, and a decision needs to be made. And, and, and you're the doctor, now, I'm the doctor now, and I've, and I've got in front of me the healthcare proxy, the person who's named in your form. And the healthcare proxy says, I think we, want to, we should do X with I, my aunt, with you, right? But then there's all this language in the, in the five wishes that may talk about that. And that may, if you're interpreting that language, be a little different from what is in the, what is the healthcare proxy is saying. And so now I'm the doctor, not a lawyer, right? I didn't go to school to read and compare documents and figure out which one is, you know, takes precedence. I'm the doctor. I'm very concerned now because I know that the healthcare proxy is saying do X, but I know you've got these instructions in here. And remember, from and this relates to the earlier slide I said I was going to bring this up, that the healthcare proxy law allows you to limit the power of the proxy and to say that the proxy won't have the authority over certain kinds of decisions. So now I'm the doctor again, and I'm trying to figure that out, right? Does this language serve to limit the power of the proxy to make this decision? My clear, first thing I do, we're gonna call my lawyer, right? We're gonna say, and the lawyer's gonna say, you know what the lawyer's gonna say, get a probate order, you know, you don't wanna, this is a liability issue, you don't wanna take the chance. So I just want you to be aware of this. If you are confronted with this possibility, or this five wishes form, or if you are um, not tempted, if you, if you think that it is appropriate to give your proxy some specific instructions, my suggestion to you is 
Even if you were putting that in writing, don't make it part of the healthcare proxy. Do a healthcare proxy designating the person you want to make these medical decisions. If you want to give that proxy some separate instructions, in writing or not, about what you, the decision should be, do that. But don't put it in the healthcare proxy, because it just could have the effect of, of, of the opposite effect from what you want, of, of actually freezing the system and forcing somebody to go get a guardianship. Next slide. Finally, finally, a few words about um, revocable trust as an alternative to a power of attorney. We talk about um, the, the, what is good and bad about a power of attorney. Certainly the power, through a power of attorney you can get what you want to have done in terms of empowering somebody to make decisions for you. But there are some issues in terms of your kind of retaining some kind of control or making sure that someone is watching that attorney. Because the typical third party confronted with a power of attorney is simply going to take the word of whoever is the named attorney. They're not going to read the document. There is an alternative. One alternative, I know that we have talked about uh, trust in the past. What is a trust? It is simply a relationship between two kinds of people. A trustee, who is the person who's got legal control and certain beneficiaries. One of the things we've talked about for people who want to avoid um, having their kids have to go through the probate process after they die, uh, is actually taking your assets, which are just in your name, and instead putting them in your name as the trustee of a revocable trust. The legal effect of that is that upon your death, instead of your assets going into your estate, they stay in trust under the control of whoever you've named as the successor trustee. And that way that successor trustee can immediately take your assets and distribute them and avoid all of the time and expense of the probate process. And we've talked about why the probate process can be expensive. Well, sim and, and, and by the way, there's a specific kind of trust that occasionally people hear of when they go to the bank. If you go to the bank and you have a bank account and the bank says, oh, well, you know, you can set up a Totten Trust. You can put on this bank account that you're the trustee and that that, and you can name who the death beneficiaries are going to be after your death. A Totten Trust is simply a form of a revocable trust. What you are saying in effect regarding that bank account is you keep complete control over the bank account, including the ability to get all the money while you're alive, and, and, the, and nobody else can get the money while you're alive. But following your death, the, the, the bank is instructed to instantly distribute everything that's in this trust to these beneficiaries so the money never goes into your estate. So one of the things you can do is in this same revocable trust that you were using basically to avoid probate, you can also say, and you know, if I die, the su successor trustee kicks in. Also you can say, if I am disabled, if somebody determines that I am disabled, whether it's my doctor or my lawyer or somebody, some third party, then the successor can start acting on my behalf right away. Um, that may end up being, if you're going in that direction in terms of doing the revocable trust anyway, then that may be the simplest solution. You'd want to do that anyway, because as to those assets that you're holding in trust, your power of attorney probably wouldn't affect them. So if you're holding your assets in a revocable trust, you may want to specify that upon your disability that that trustee, that successor trustee can step in and do all of those things on your behalf to take care of your assets. Uh, that way, as I mentioned, you can, keep, you can keep at least as much control, if not more control, of your assets as long as you are capable of taking care of them, while at the same time taking care of these other issues. Because in that trust, it's very easy also to name that third party who's going to be kind of watching over the successor trustee. Um, so a few, a few revocable, revocable trust tips, by the way. I spent years saying that the word was revocable and not revocable. And clients kept coming up to me saying, well, you know, I think it's revocable. I think that's how you say it. So finally I had changed. Last year I had finally changed and started saying revocable. And so I went, but then I started at Myrick O'Connell, and the first meeting that we had of the, the, the Trusts and Estates Division, and Janet Moore was there and these others, and they started referring to revocable trusts. And I said, isn't it revocable? And they all were all looking at, they all looked at me like, no, you don't. It's re that's a revocable trust. So I'm back now. And I'm still, I'm still not sure. So I kind of do it both ways. Um, so 
we, um, um, we talked about if there's going to be a, a, if we're using a revocable trust or a revocable trust, creating a standard regarding incapacity or naming a specific person who can make that decision about whether you're, you have capacity or not. Um, second, you want to talk about removal. If a successor trustee has been named, right, um, you want to make sure because you're incapacitated and after a while you become unincapacitated, you want to make sure you have the ability to get rid of that successor and get yourself back. Um, finally, what, what you would typically want to specify is that while the trust remains revocable or revocable and amendable by you during your lifetime, that all of the rules regarding how things get distributed after your death become irrevocable after your death. So that the substitute can't come in and, and, and change the rules and say, oh, you know, auntie really meant me to get all the money. And so I'm going to amend this and then I'm going to distribute the money to myself. So look, a, few, a few tips. Um, as you know, the purpose of all of these tips is to allow you just to think out the issues, think out the issues ahead of time, because any of these issues you can plan against ahead of time. And the goal is to make sure that you can sleep well at night. Thank you very much. Any questions?